Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on Shaping Our Rural Future, which has been hosted by the Minister for Rural and Community Development, Heather Humphreys. My name is William Parnell, and I'm head of the Rural Development Division in the department. I'd like to give you a brief outline of this morning's event before I hand over to the Minister for her opening address, and I'll mention a few housekeeping points as well. We've had a great interest in this webinar, with over 200 people registered. So to keep things running as smoothly as possible from a technological point of view, you may have already noticed that we've locked down your video and audio options. However, you will have an opportunity to contribute today by asking questions in the course of the event using the chat function, which you'll find on the menu bar towards the bottom of your screen. I should also mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online through the gov.ie website. Those of you who are familiar with using online conference facilities, and I think that's probably an awful lot of us at this stage, um, will be aware that you can choose different screen options to view the speakers and the participants. So on the platform that we're using today, these options are towards the top right-hand corner of your screen. We'd suggest that for the best experience of today's conversation, you use the active speaker and thumbnail view that's available up there. Um, we're also very pleased to have sign language interpretation available today. And for those of you who prefer this option, the grid view may provide you with the best experience. In a moment, I'll hand over to Minister Humphreys. The Minister's opening address will be followed by a panel discussion on shaping our rural future, which will be chaired by my colleague, Andrew Ford. We are delighted to have a panel of very distinguished speakers who are really familiar with the issues impacting rural Ireland today. Our panellists are Seamus Boland from Irish Rural Inc, Emma Kearns from Chambers Ireland, Pat Dowling from Clare County Council, and Tracy Kyo from Grow Remote. Andrew will introduce the panellists to you more fully at the start of that session. As I've said, there will be an opportunity for you to put questions to the panellists using the chat function. And finally, at the end of that session, I will call on Minister Humphreys to deliver some closing remarks, and we aim to finish up by 12.15 at the latest. So now I'll hand over to Minister Humphreys for her opening address. Um, thank you uh, for that, uh, William, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, just to say thank you for uh, joining our webinar. Uh, it's great to see such a, a strong level of interest uh, in shaping the future of rural Ireland uh, at this pivotal time, of course, in our country's history. And there's no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic it has changed every aspect of our lives, how we socialise, how we work, how we study, and indeed how we interact with each other. And uh, it's likely that we're going to see some disruption uh, in the way we go about our lives uh, for some time to come. But as we work through COVID-19 uh, um, you know, and look to the future, we really do have an unprecedented opportunity to, to reshape our economy and to reshape our society. We also have a, a, an opportunity uh, to uh, revalue the importance of rural Ireland to our overall national development and to reimagine what rural Ireland means to our economy and to our society. So, notwithstanding the challenges that do lie ahead, uh, there are exciting opportunities emerging uh, for rural Ireland in areas such as the broad broadband rollout uh, and new sectors such as the bioeconomy. Uh, we have also seen some really powerful examples over the last six months of how resilient our uh, communities and our businesses are. And we have seen how businesses have adapted to meet the needs of a changed marketplace. And we have seen a step change in our thinking about how and where we work. As someone said to me uh, only recently, work is what you do, it's not where you do it. Remote working or connected working, as I prefer to call it, has the potential to transform rural Ireland and to enable people to uh, pursue good careers while continuing to live in rural areas. And this is not just an aspiration. We're seeing the evidence in front of our own eyes. 
Connected working is reducing uh, commutes for many workers, it's providing increased uh, uh, custom for local businesses because people are, are working locally, they're shopping locally, uh, and it's even attracting people to move back uh, to areas that they grew up in. And indeed, uh, I've had a number of conversations with constituents in my own uh, uh, county of Monaghan where they have uh, traditionally been living in Dublin. They now see this as an opportunity to move back to Monaghan and, uh, you know, set up home there and maybe commute to Dublin one or two days a week. Uh, so, so it has uh, opened up new opportunities uh, for, for many of us. And, and the shift away from the model of a fixed workplace to a more fluid blend of remote and connected working, it will be supported by an increased network of co-working spaces uh, and enterprise hubs uh, across the country. So my department uh, has uh, invested significantly in these hubs over the last number of years. And of course, uh, in my former department, uh, agencies such as Enterprise Ireland and uh, Udras Nagirtha that have also uh, invested in, in these uh, spaces as well. And, and these hubs actually offer new and expanding companies the opportunity to locate outside uh, the main cities either as primary locations or advanced second sites. And uh, they also uh, afford an opportunity for the decentralization of public services. So, and some companies are looking now, do they need to have uh, such a large uh, footprint in our cities? And, or how can they actually, uh, you know, benefit their company from using remote sites in, in, in cheaper rural locations? And also, which, it, it, you know, it also helps their employees uh, maybe to have a better, uh, quality of life, a better work-life balance. Uh, so this is something that they're looking at as well. So just to say that uh, the government will continue to invest strategically in remote working hubs in rural Ireland over the coming years to create a cohesive network of facilities across the country. And that's going to be backed up by the rollout uh, of um, high-speed broadband through the National Broadband Plan. And I'm delighted uh, to see that uh, Tracy Kyo uh, from Grow Remote is a participant in our panel discussion today. And uh, I look forward to hearing what Tracy has to say about the issue of connected working. I've worked with uh, Tracy before in my previous department. And in fact, uh, last year uh, we had a, a specific cabinet meeting that looked at future jobs and, and the world of work in the future. And a, big, a very much a strong part of that was looking at remote working. And, and Tracy, uh, you know, has has a really really good insight into how this worked for her and for a growing number of people. So it's good to see you on board uh, today, Tracy. Uh, just to say also that uh, we uh, we you know I've mentioned that we have a an unprecedented opportunity to revalue the importance uh, of rural Ireland and our overall national development. Uh, as we emerge from COVID-19 crisis and look to the future, my message is, is very simple. Rural Ireland must be a central part of our national economic and social recovery. Ireland's economy, its heritage and culture is so heavily dependent on the contribution of rural areas. Rural based businesses from micro enterprises to large multinational companies support hundreds of thousands of jobs in rural areas and contribute significantly to our national uh, prosperity. So my immediate priority for rural Ireland is to develop and publish a new five year rural development strategy, which will recognize the importance of rural economies and society to our national well being. It will build on the action plan for rural development uh, that I had the pleasure of launching uh, way back in uh, 20, uh, I think it was 2016. And, uh, and uh, you know, and this here is also going to take a whole of government approach. The policy will address the impact of COVID-19 on rural areas, but it's also going to be forward looking and ambitious and it's going to seek to, to realise opportunities in rural areas in relation to sectoral diversification, digital connectivity, climate adaptation and support, of course, our island communities. It will also importantly emphasise the interdependency between uh, rural areas and urban areas. And the policy will seek to build resilience in our rural economies and communities to mitigate against future shocks. 
As a government, we have a responsibility to ensure that no one is left behind as we re rebuild our economy and our society. And the concept of a just transition applies not just to climate adaptation, but to other areas such as digitalization, automation and future ways of working, which we can't uh, yet even imagine. So my department has held a wide range uh, of consultation events in developing the new policy, uh, which some of you will have uh, participated in. It also invited members of the public to contribute their views uh, on the key challenges and opportunities facing rural Ireland uh, through an online survey. So there was a significant response to that survey with over 1700 uh, submissions. So today's event will make a further important contribution to the policy, which I'm hoping to launch over the coming months. Uh, we really do have an excellent pal panel joining us who will help to tease out some of the key issues affecting rural Ireland today and into the future. And I'm really looking forward uh, to uh, their discussions. So, uh, without any further ado, I will hand over to Andrew Ford from my department, who will introduce the panellists and chair the session. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and good, good morning, everybody. Um, Minister, thanks a lot for those, those very important reflections, which I think provide an excellent context for our discussion today. And no doubt the panellists will be building on some of those points and introducing, no doubt, some more. Uh, so we're going to move now quickly on to the panel discussion, which is um, the, the core part of our, our, our morning session today. Um, so I'd like to invite all the panellists, first of all, to turn on your videos and your microphones if you haven't already done so. Um, I'm, it's really my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panellists. Um, first, to, to go to Seamus Boland, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Irish Rural Link. Many of you will know that Irish Rural Link is the national network campaigning for sustainable rural development and directly represents 600 plus community groups with a combined membership of over 25,000 across a range of policy areas. I should also like to acknowledge that Seamus has recently been elected as the new president of the European Economic and Social Council's uh, Civil Society Committee. So that's an excellent accolade for, for an Irishman and for Seamus and indeed Irish Rural Link. So we congratulate you heartily, Seamus, on that. Um, Tracy Kyo has already been introduced by the Minister. She's co-founder of Grow Remote. And Grow Remote is a very exciting and innovative social enterprise, which is helping to make remote working uh, a reality for employers and employees and to be transformative really for rural Ireland. Our third speaker is uh, Emma Kearns, and she's the Head of Policy and Public Affairs at Chambers Ireland. Chambers Ireland represents the largest network of businesses in the state, with 40 chambers representing over 8,000 businesses right across the length and breadth of the country. Chambers Ireland seeks to make the places we live better places to work and indeed to do business. And last but not least, uh, Pat Dowling is the Chief Executive of Clare County Council. And Clare County Council has been really a champion of rural development, supporting numerous very innovative schemes, programs and approaches towards rural development with a view to supporting uh, economic and social development and improving quality of life of, of residents in, in County Clare. You're all really very welcome to our panel discussion this morning and thanks for taking the time to join us. And indeed, thanks to um, all of the attendees for, for, for signing in from throughout the country uh, this morning. Uh, can I ask panelists before we begin, just to try uh, in the interest of time to be as focused as you possibly can. I know that's difficult. We could spend the day probably speaking about these issues, but uh, I do have the unenviable task of uh, keeping to time. So uh, I appreciate in advance if you can. So listen, if I might start, Seamus, actually there's a little bit of background noise. I might ask other speakers for a moment to just turn off your, your microphones. Uh, because there is a little bit of interference. Thanks very much. And Seamus, um, if I might start with yourself, uh, Irish Rural Link has run a, a really interesting series of consultations uh, online in the last number of months on a variety of topics pertinent to rural development. Could I ask you maybe, Seamus, to briefly give us a sense of, of what emerged from those discussions? What would you consider to be the key messages from those engagements? Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thanks to the Minister, and I welcome her launch of the Rural Development 
program. Yes, we have. We've we've held about ten seminars, I suppose, at this stage. You'll see them on YouTube if anybody wants to see them. I think the key messages really are uh, it started out with a question of how are we in terms of COVID? How are we coping? How are we management? And at that time we had a very strong group of people, volunteers around the country, which I think should be renewed again, uh, who are working with people who are isolated, people who are cocooning. And I, I suppose we had a broad range of people. And I say this, Andrew, because it's very careful. It was almost like we had a field study uh, in which we had hundreds of volunteers around the country visiting the households, households and people who were cocooning. And they were learning a great deal. They were learning about people suddenly at home working in some cases, younger, a lot more younger people. And one of the things, Andrew, they noticed was uh, when they went down a boreen or a rural roadway, there was actually people at the houses, which is not, which was not the case in, in the previous situation. So the first message I, I'll say was that the experience of more people at home working or working from villages or wherever there was a good computer link or internet link was a good experience. And funnily enough, uh, retailers, particularly small shops in local villages, found that their business went up. I suppose the second message uh, we got through that rural Ireland is vibrant, but it does need to look at how we manage social services and access to social services. And I know, Andrew, you did a great program on social enterprise, which you continue to do, and William as well. And really, social enterprises is an opening here, and I think we need to develop that further. And that was another message. I suppose the third message I would say from from the seminar so far was that to quote uh, Leo Varadkar uh, when he was Taoiseach, was, this is actually an opportunity for rural Ireland. Yes, let's not play it. Let's not get overcome or anything else, because must remember, people who have died and people who are suffering. And we must remember the dangers of COVID and we must remember that we do have to be very careful still. So I, when I say opportunity, I mean it in the context of understanding that. And the opportunity is we are now really being forced to change our behavior. We're being forced to change everything, it, literally in revolutionary style uh, and certainly if there ever was a need for rural broadband, I think that argument is well and truly won at this stage. And certainly in Irish Rural Link, we don't want to hear any more naysayers on that. So I suppose those are the messages in terms, in a brief sense, of rural Ireland looking at this, A, as an opportunity, but B, seeing it as a place where we've got to develop employment opportunities in the regions, and we can do so using good technology. That's that's very uh, helpful, Seamus. Very interesting. Could I ask you just to, to build on? You, you focused a lot there on the on the community call, the community response. I mean, wh what's your perception about how we can build on that? How do we keep that uh, community spirit going, Seamus? Well, we, we 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 linked into it along with the wheel. We had something over thirty five community champions. These are people of, of, across a wide spectrum like GA players, we had Michael Dignan of Offaly, Anthony Daly. We had so many more people who actually, and their job was to use the existing volunteer structures, whether it's the existing sporting, social, cultural organizations. And the plan was that if somebody needed help, they would be able to get in touch with somebody they knew. So, for example, the coordinator simply said, who is living on Ballymagahan, we make up village, uh, who knows that area very well? And would you volunteer to bring uh, groceries, supplies, make sure, you know, if there's something need fixing, that that can be organized in the house. It did two things. It made the people who are cocooning a lot more comfortable and secure. And it also uh, contributed to easing the load loneliness, because it is quite lonely. And we do know there are studies in about rural areas suffering from isolation. 
this program was suspended at the end of June, and we really would be asking the minister, I suppose, if she would make sure that this continues on. At the moment, we're under serious pressure to, re to restart it again. But really, what I'm saying here is that this created a great atmosphere for people who are cocooning. And I'm afraid, Andrew, with the figures at the moment, more and more older people are rightly taking precautions and going back to that space. So we would like to see that continue. But it really was a great opportunity to understand life for people who are uh, in living in isolation. Thanks, Seamus. Pat. May I, can I bring you in there for a minute? Because I think, you know, the, one of the, 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 the very key features of the whole community call was the collaboration between local authorities and community groups, right? The length and breadth of the country. Could, could you share your perspectives on what that collaboration was like, how it worked and maybe how it could be built upon? Sure, Andrew. Uh, first of all, to thank uh, the Minister and indeed William Parnell for convening this. I think it's very good. And I'm delighted that Minister Humphreys has the brief she has in the context of her field for rural Ireland. So I think that's important. Yeah, the community resilience program, Andrew, was very important. And in many ways, it wasn't that, and I'm sure Seamus might agree with me, it wasn't that we had to build something new. It was very much a recognition and an endorsement of that voluntary effort that still exists on the ground. Many people say that volunteerism is, is, is decreasing and dying. It has most definitely changed. We all know that because the way society is going. But I think in a strange, bizarre manner, COVID uh, unearthed yet again the goodwill of people across all communities, urban and rural. And I mean, I chaired the forum here in, in Clare, and we had an immediate response. And I think within about the first week, we had over 400 volunteers with their hands up waving, wanting to help. And then, as Seamus mentioned, we brought in other things. Anthony Daly came in as our as our ambassador and all of that, and it worked very well. And I think most local authorities had the overall experience that while a structure was brought together at county level with all the agencies and the volunteers enlisted and there was a screening that had to be done and all of that, there was very little selling that required to be done. People just responded naturally across all, particularly the rural communities, and got stuck in. And we even found that we, 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 it was hard to keep to, to play catch up with actually what was going on. Groups were going off helping immediately because it wasn't their instinct to do so. That's a very typical Irish cultural thing. Uh, and I think in a strange way, COVID has helped again to, to restate that local volunteers helping each other, uh, celebrating the need to help vulnerable people, whether they're elderly or in our community is at the heart of Irish culture. And that's what this programme has done. And I think whatever about what happens into the future, I think it does an onus on all of us to keep that structure going, formally or informally, to make sure that all these individuals who help, and it wasn't just the GA clubs, it wasn't the ICA groups, it wasn't whatever, it was everybody across all aspects of rural life that helped. And I think from my experience of it was, while I sat in the council chamber having meetings, virtual or otherwise, the real work was out on the ground with people helping those because they know who they are, they know where they live, they know their needs, uh, etc. And I think it, it was a wonderful experience for me going around seeing what was happening on the ground. And I think that's something we shouldn't lose in the context of rural development generally, uh, whatever about COVID, Rural development into the future is all about rural people helping each other. Thanks very much, Pat and Seamus, for your um, inputs there. Yeah, indeed, community spirit is like a synonym, synonym really for rural Ireland, isn't it? And it's just come, come, come to its own uh, during this time of crisis. If I can move on just to another topic in the interest of time, I, I'd like to move to, to Emma Cairns from Chambers Ireland for a moment. Um, Emma, Rural businesses, in fact, all businesses have been severely and continue to be severely affected by COVID. And obviously it's a very live issue. And we can see even just this morning from your Chambers Ireland member survey that uh, on average turnover is going to be 30% less than this time last year. Against that backdrop, what in your opinion is needed to rebuild rural economies and to encourage more companies to locate in rural areas, Emma? Thanks, Andrew, um, and also thanks to the Minister and for the Department for bringing us on. 
Um, the big thing, it's, it's infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Um, and we don't just mean transport and broadband, you mean energy, water. If you want economies to recover, you need to make to build it and, and they will come in, in very much in line with that, that expression. The biggest obstacles that we find from our members to companies expanding or relocating is the right infrastructure isn't there. So if we can get that right, we will be able to do a lot to kind of bring about, you know, balanced regional development. It's it's a lofty goal and it's it's one we share with this department and other departments. That's what makes that happen. And um, now we have a national frame, planning framework. We have regional strategies and um, we need to deliver those. Um, I think to inter department does around towns and villages, we need a national strategy for town centres. Um, urban spaces and town centres have been really badly hit and from COVID. Um, now, in many ways, lots of urban centres and towns have responded to COVID by trying to create more space and make places more people friendly and people centric. Um, we need to do more on that and build more on that. Um, one of our big asks um, ahead of the, the new programme for government and, and following that um, and it, it was heard and reflected on was a, a town centre first strategy, but that needs to be interdepartmental. Like this department needs to be supported in delivering on that. It needs proper resources, scale and ambition to deliver that so that we can address any planning issues, so that we can have healthy streets, that we can renovate older buildings, that we can incentivize. If we can put people and businesses back at the heart of town centres, the economies will recover and the economies will flourish. And that ties into what Pat said and Seamus has said, when people were back, you know, at home every day and, and keeping to like small pods of communities. They were spending locally and my business has seen an uptick. So that's a lesson we can learn and it's a lesson we must build on. Um, and, you know, with that then as well is your remote working piece. And it's about making sure that you have the hubs, which this department very much supports. And I know the Western Development Commission, I think I've seen a few people logging on from the WDC today as well. They're doing huge work on that. If we can get those hubs in town centres, and we can tie all of these parts together, we can support economies to flourish, but it needs scale and it needs a lot of cross departmental thinking to get it really, really right. Um, so that's sort of where we're coming from on it. And no matter what chamber we talk to, regardless what part of the country, you could be in Kerry, you could be in Dundalk, they're telling us exactly the same things about what we need. So I think there's an opportunity here at the start of a, of a new government to, to let that be the legacy of COVID. And that's sort of our take on that. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, something you, you hear a lot more of nowadays is that, you know, it's not just a question of us uh, building back our economies to the way they were, but actually to season, seizing this opportunity to mm -hmm. really build back better, to use that phrase that's really yeah, seems to be brought yeah. on. I, I think a lot of people tuned in to this uh, discussion today would be interested to hear your views on the potential for innovation, for diversification mm -hmm. of the rural economy. What does that look like? Where do you see the opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Um, Seamus alluded to a couple of bits there around technology um, and what technology can do when people have access to it and the right infrastructure and broadband to, to kind of um, innovate. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in, in the, the agri sectors. So, you know, um, biofuels, um, energy creation, microgeneration, um, agri technology is great. Um, if you can get the broadband infrastructure, you can also make sure that rural Ireland is also home to a very, very vibrant, innovative tech cluster as well, because, you know, you don't need big towns necessarily to to uh, to work on those kinds of projects or set up those kinds of companies. Um, another angle, though, and this ties in with the energy space as well, and it's something we've been looking at and, and talking to other stakeholders on, is the potential for like offshore wind energy, um, because that's going to be a huge industry of huge scale over the next couple of decades. Now, this is a long-term plan, but you know, a lot of things have to happen now to deliver on that. That could transform marine towns and coastal towns and bring really, really high value jobs to places that maybe have had a hard time of it over the last couple of decades. I mean, there's huge potential now in Arklow with, with some of the plans that are there off, off the, the Eastern coast. Um, there could be huge potential in the, the southwest and, and the western coast in, in the next 20 years on that. Um, and that bring with that is, is investment, it's skills, it's, it's clustered industries that go with that as well. So there's an awful lot of things aligning at the moment that could deliver high value jobs to rural economies and, and transform parts of the country that maybe have struggled. Um, but at the root of that, it's technology, it's investment, and it's delivering an infrastructure. When you do those things, you know the jobs and the money and the investment follows. 
Thanks, Thanks Emma. Uh, uh, actually, could I just have to mute your microphone for a second, Emma? A lot of feedback there. Um, I'm sure the Eagle Eye uh, observers will have noticed the SDG logo over your left shoulder. Um, and, you know, I guess that is going to be something that's going to have to feature in all of our future work around sustainability and ensuring those issues are, are addressed. If I could just turn to Tracy um, and bring Tracy in, because there was a number of issues there that Emma raised around technology and innovation and opportunity. And of course, both Seamus and Pat have also referred directly to the issue of uh, remote work. Um, remote working, Tracy, it's not something just kind of progressive and innovative. I mean, it's been thrust upon us um, and we're all muddling through as best we can. We'd probably prefer to have this uh, event face to face, but you know, this is where we are. Um, Grow Remote is a social enterprise right at the heart of that revolution, if, if, if you want to put it that way. So I want to ask you, I mean, how do you see remote working impacting on rural areas and, and what can be done by the state, by communities, by local authorities to, to really fully realise its potential? Thanks, Mill and Andrew. Sorry, just to say it's actually very exciting to hear all of us on kind of speaking in our own separately, but together. It's I think it's very rare because we're always kind of you have to paddle your own canoe, you have to do the work on the ground. You don't always get time to link in with other groups. It's just it's really I can feel the energy. Um, but Andrew, sorry, um, and I'm sorry. Back to just Emma's point around town centres. Like I, I couldn't agree more, Emma. And I know Kent Oven's doing lots of work in that, but that's so crucially important for everything. I've already forgotten your question, but oh, sorry, Andrew. Yes, right. Uh, Pat mentioned there around rural Ireland and um, keeping it, you know, that it's by rural, rural people for rural people. I read a, a definition of community development once, which is equipping people with the tools and resources to make change in their own environment. And the brilliant thing about remote work uh, is that it's within everybody's capability to generate that employment locally. So the biggest kind of educational piece or the barrier that we have to cross and go remote is this idea that remote work will someday land in our communities. Remote work is kind of like um, a file that's in the cloud, it's on your computer. You don't have it until you click download. It's the best analogy that I can come up with lately, um, but, but it is there. So in any one community in Ireland, there are at least 300 jobs open now. When I say jobs, I mean permanent pensionable careers in companies that just don't care where you are. And when they say remote, they mean locationless, so it could be Dublin City Centre, but it could be Armour Island. And to get back to your question, um, Andrew, for us, the reason that we got remote work is because we wanted to take a first principles approach to community development. Once we have employment, we can get to the stuff that we actually want to do, but we can't do unless we have the employment. And traditionally, we would have looked to attracting big employers to satellite offices to try and get somebody in Dublin to open up 60, 70 jobs in wherever. And that's a completely different sell. But with remote work, we don't have to sell somebody in a ivory tower. We just have to sell somebody on, do you want to come home? And that's a completely different sell. It's so much easier and there's so much more to it. Or, so that's, I guess, for us, the, 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 the impact on communities is that when you plug in employment, you can get your main streets back. You can have people with time for the GAA. They don't have to commute out. It's everything. We just are our, our local communities back in that in that very local sense. And Tracy, um, if I can just build on that a little bit, you've seen we've seen a lot of um, remote working hubs um, uh, pop up throughout rural Ireland. They're they're constantly expanding now along the Atlantic Economic Corridor. A huge amount of work, fantastic work, has been done by the. Western Development Commission and others. What are your views about the importance of these hubs to facilitate remote working? I think that they're just crucially important for lots of different reasons. I mean, they're not just remote working hubs. They have freelancers, startups, um, all sorts of organisations in there. And when you mesh all those groups together, magic stuff happens. You'll see it in the likes of the Portishead and many other places, HQ3, just because that's in, in top of my head. Lots of places you'll see that magic happening. But mostly for the people who would work, work remotely before, they would work from their home. Not only is that not so good for, for them, but also if we can get them into town centres every day, they're into town centres every day. And I don't know if you know about you would, Andrew, but on the broken windows theory, how important our main streets are to the health of the surrounding community. And so if we can get that vibrant, you know, free flow of people through, it's really important. But I would say, though, um, around three years ago, so I've been working in uh, co-working spaces for maybe five years. Three years ago, a hub opened up in a commuter town and we thought, brilliant, we're going to go to the train station. So we went there at six o'clock in the morning. We were like, why are you commuting? You don't have to anymore. The hub is there. 
And I remember two things came out of that. One is some people like commuting because they like the time in the morning and the evening, they don't have to cook dinner, all that stuff. The second thing is that people who are commuting, as they said to us, we're not commuting because we have the option. Our employer doesn't allow us to work remotely. And maybe you might get a one-off deal, but you're actually going to be on the back foot longer term. You won't have a career progression, any of that stuff. And that's when we realise that digital hubs are one part, but the root of the problem is in the policy, culture and technology of organisations, largely in Dublin. Um, and we need to attract the problem from the root. So Grow Remote is working with 15 companies that are on the transition from in-office to remote. Um, and that, what we want to see at the end of the day is, I'll mention some of the companies' names now, but maybe HubSpot, Twitter and uh, the ESB. Their career site this time in six months, instead of saying jobs are in Dublin, and maybe if you get that job in Dublin, you might be able to bring it home eventually if you're trusted enough. In six months' time, those jobs will be advertised with the location being remote. I mean, do it in Dublin or do it at home. And that's when we know that something, something has fundamentally changed and we'll have a little bit more of a sense of security around moving and living in our local communities. Tracy, thanks very much. And I guess it's that, you know, showing those examples from some of the big companies can also maybe inspire others. Because there, I, I presume there's probably a certain amount of a, maybe a conservative approach, maybe just a, maybe some concern about how it works or whatever it might be. But, you know, those kind of good examples will certainly help to inspire others. Could I ask Seamus to come in there for a minute? Seamus, um, you, you mentioned this earlier, of course, and you mentioned very strongly uh, the issue of, of the National Broadband Plan and, and, and it being a transformative um, uh, project for, for Ireland. What are your views um, on the opportunity presented by, by that broadband plan and the importance for, for rural areas? If you can just expand on that based on Tracy's comments. Well, indeed, and, and thank you, Tracy, because Tracy participated in one of our uh, webinars as well, and she was really uh, is so passionate about it. Yes, of course. I mean, broadband it opens up a whole lot of doors. The employment door, which Tracy has just referred to, it, it, you know, we can't say enough about that. And I suppose I would add to that that in terms of companies, whether it's Google or Manhattan Public, whatever it is. They could, if they're, they're encouraged, uh, come bring jobs back to Ireland. So I would be saying that perhaps the IDA and Enterprise Ireland might might get, um, I say, an extension in terms of not just bringing foreign direct investment in physical terms, but in in digital terms as well. So I think that's an opportunity. I think what broadband also does it improves enormously another problem we have on our tracks, uh, care and the homes. With really good technology, you can now have people linked to various uh, medical centres, doctors, even hospitals in terms of monitoring their situation, monitoring their health. And this would this would enormously change the whole, um, I suppose, landscape in terms of how we care for people in the homes. And I think, again, you know, this government uh, and previous government actually are saying that we now have to relook at how we care for people in the homes. And I think digital uh, opportunities really are important. So it's not just the creation of employment, which is extremely useful, but it's also the creation of uh, the provision of other services, social services, that are really important. I suppose that, Andrew, I would see as a major piece of work still to be done. Thanks a lot, Seamus. It's really about rethinking almost how we live our lives and how we develop, how we deliver services. Um, Pat, turning to yourself, if I may, uh, building on all of those questions, I'm sure you have a lot of opinions on everything that's been said, but, but I want to specifically talk to you about the role of, of local authorities who, who really are right at the cold face and uh, you know uh, really front and center in terms of economic and social and cultural development of rural areas and Clare County Council as I said at the outset has taken numerous really innovative initiatives uh, not least the creation of the rural department in your county council and I wondered if you could share your views on what local authorities can do further to support economic and social well-being in rural areas. Uh, sh sure, Andrew, uh, happy to do so. And I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, local government, uh, like it or loaded, it, but it is the agency that is closest to the citizen. Uh, and when I hear Seamus and Tracy and Emma talk about things that we need to do, a lot of those things are often enabled by the local authority. 
around infrastructure and services, etc. So, very quickly, uh, when, when I started in Clare some years back, uh, it was clear to me at the moment that there needed to be a targeted focus on, on our rural economy and on rural development. 50% uh, of the population of Clare live in countryside dwellings. So, it was clear to me as a rural county that while we have the two towns of Ennis and Shannon, and a lot is going on there, the, the vast majority of people in Clare are, are rural dwellers. And, and therefore, there was a particular need to focus on that. So, I immediately appointed a director for rural development and it's part of my senior management team and put together a department, uh, not unlike housing, planning, environment, and that. So, it was a, a department at the senior management level at, at the table, uh, meeting on a fortnightly basis to discuss the range of issues. I staffed that department, but in particular, I appointed four rural development officers one per municipal district to work with that department to go out onto the ground and animate the rural areas because i often i find that a lot of the rural communities need assistance to help themselves uh you know the capability isn't always there it it, it is in many cases so they were appointed further to that then i established a rural uh, forum for the county uh, there are about over 35 different agencies across all the key stakeholders in County Clare, and they meet on a regular basis. And that forum, with the new directed, uh, produced a rural development strategy, which was launched by Minister Humphrey's predecessor, Michael Ring, back a couple of years ago. So it's relatively new. So what I've simply done, Andrew, is I've institutionalized within Clare County Council the need to focus and to positively discriminate in favor of rural County Clare. Now, the strategy came up with a number of issues uh, around jobs creation, multi-service centres, cooperating towns, uh, partnering parishes, uh, e-working obviously on the innovation hubs, incubation units and all that. So that's what we've done. And people mentioned hubs and if I could just cover that, we now have six hubs across the county. We will have six more before the end of the year. Uh, and more importantly, what's happening is the experience has shown through my rural development section that now there's a demand coming forward. So we're opening a hub in Cross School that closed two years ago. So we're reopening the school. We're opening a hub in the community centre in Flagmount, run by the community centre, but under our DigiClare brand. And we're also opening hubs upstairs over credit unions because they've come to us. So what we never thought would happen is that other groups have come on board and while we're running them directly, a lot of them we're doing in partnership with existing community groups, helping, as I said, to turn the lights back on to a school that would probably not reopen. So that's one of the, the outcomes of it, as well as a lot of others. So I think that's what we've done. Not every local authority is doing that, but many are adopting a similar approach. And as we go forward, and I think the minister knows this, and while we may have a new national rural strategy, we need the apparatus and the architecture locally to make sure we can deliver that. And that's what I've done in Clare. And it's all of that is tourism as well, obviously, and lots of other areas of rural development in the context of Clare. But it's worked very well. It's making an impact. And I think it's a model that while we talk about strategies, we must have the, the capabilities within the local public agencies on the ground to actually deliver it. Many thanks, Pat. Can, can I bring you back to a, a point that was very strongly made by Emma and then echoed as well by Tracy and, and Adit Seamus around towns and villages? Um, mm -hmm. uh, rural towns and villages are obviously at the heart of rural communities. Um, but how do we ensure, Pat, that they are vibrant and lived in places? Yeah, I, I mean, this is the key challenge for us. And I mean, if you look at any census data, the scale of, because at least whatever it is, I'd have to check the data. But, Towns and villages comprise about a third of the population of Ireland. Another third are the large cities in that. So there's a huge issue. And from the local authority perspective, obviously there's issues around jobs, there's issues around how we deal with communities in developing alternative environmental projects, et cetera. But there are key infrastructural things that are key enablers. And I think the minister knows this, the whole area of water and wastewater treatment is a huge problem in rural communities. I have about 56 wastewater schemes I need to put into County Clare today if I'm to attract people to come and live there and work there. 
and go to school there, etc. So that's a huge piece of infrastructure that Irish Water have in their responsibility. I'm concerned that it won't happen in time to save rural communities. And I think uh, the minister, if she's listening, you know, I, we'd be keen to make it on ourselves in a way to work in partnership to deliver those schemes across those communities, because without that, it's very difficult for people to apply for planning permission to live in rural communities, to come and work there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the other part of, of um, those rural towns and villages are services for multi-service delivery. So, for example, all the agencies are working separately. We're collaborating and collaborating very well. But I think we need multi-service uh, locations within our communities. Uh, we have one example in Kilmele, um, uh, not far from Ennis, where uh, there's an independent living scheme for elderly people built by the local community, supported by government and the council, where those local people are also access medical services because a doctor's clinic is held on a regular basis and other additional services as well. Seamus mentioned this in the context of the needs of the elderly members of our population. So I think the services need to come together within these rural areas for economies of scale. And I think there's a lot to be gained from that. The jobs one is a big one, and we've mentioned remote working, but it's more than just the hubs that we're doing. We are at the moment identifying key strategic sites in West Clare that we can attract FDI. Tracy mentioned it. Uh, so there are a number of locations. So if companies are interested in coming to the West the rural parts of this country, the local authority should facilitate them getting there and having facilities ready for them to occupy. I think there are particular opportunities uh, that we could help to fund as well, that the new rural development strategy can work with all of us to engage with FDIs or smaller companies that some of their workers can operate and live in rural communities. Because it is a lattice of services, there's no one thing. For people to come and work and live, they must have access to education, infrastructure, connectivity, and basic infrastructural services. So I think we need to look at those. And I think we might do, we should maybe do demonstration projects. We'd be, I'd be happy to put my hand up to do one and pick a particular town or village to show what can be achieved and do a lattice of those across the Western seaboard and show within a matter of three years what we can achieve together as agencies for people to come and live and work. But it's a romantic idea often if we think they can just come and plant themselves in a rural area unless the infrastructure and the services are there. And therein lies some of our particular challenges. Pat, many thanks. A lot of very interesting issues there have come up. And actually, um, it leads me into questions that we've received. I should say, first of all, uh, you're, you're getting a, you have a lot of fans out there, all of you, because there's a lot of positive comments coming in about what you're saying around the community call and the centrality of communities the importance of remote working, um, uh, the opportunities uh, presented by social enterprise and cooperative model, uh, and the need for a whole of government approach. They're just some of the positive comments that have come into us. But um, it, it just leads me to one of the questions that was asked was around resilience. Um, and Emma, if I could just bring you in there, because I think it would fit nicely with what Pat was discussing. Um, like the panel has discussed, uh, you know, referred to the one way or the other, the, the economic challenges that we're facing with right now. And there are more coming down tr the tracks yeah. as well. But how can rural Ireland, and this is the question, how can rural Ireland ensure that it is resilient enough to deal with future challenges? <laughs> There's a lot to say on that in terms of what it can do. Um, what needs to be done to support that, um, I think is, it ties in a little bit with what Pat and Tracy and James have been saying is around remote working and being able to properly enable that choice. So this isn't rural versus urban and, you know, people deciding to flee the towns and cities because the COVID's there and we need to actually live somewhere far away from everyone. Um, people just found that if they didn't have to commute every day, how would they spend their lives? And that's what's bringing and keeping people, a lot of people in, in, in uh, more rural parts of the country. But how do you drive that resilience um, in the longer term? Because the economic impact is, is very severe. Um, and some of our data early in the summer, we released survey results this morning, but it's the fifth in a series. And we did a sectoral and geographic breakdown back in May. And the Atlantic Economic Corridor is going to be the worst hit because 
tourism, hospitality, and, and so many of the events-based industries um, are the ones in the most trouble, and they're predominantly clustered in those tourist spots. So you need to diversify the industry that's there. So how do you build resilience? Um, it's not a choice that people in rural Ireland are going to have to make. It's a choice that's going to have to be enabled. So it's about thinking bigger, being more ambitious for the kinds of industries um, and technologies that we can use in rural Ireland that will actually enable growth. Um, and it's about investing and spending money and delivering. Uh, we have a fantastic plan in the MPF and the NDP in terms of what Ireland can look like in a few decades. We need to get that done um, and we need to get public support for how we deliver that. Um, and we just need to make sure that anything that doesn't enable towns to do what people in towns want them to do, which is building houses and setting up businesses, things like lack of wastewater infrastructure, as Pat says, like I was nodding so hard when he was <laughs> talking there because we've heard it everywhere that people want to build and people want to invest, but they can't because. So rural Ireland isn't going to be resilient and isn't going to be part of the recovery unless they're supported and enabled to be part of the recovery. And part of that's money, but also part of that is taking away the planning obstacles, taking away like, I mean, on, on remote working, like Tracy's been like, hubs won't solve everything in and of themselves. You know, there was a consultation with the Tonish that um, earlier in the summer around what a remote working strategy needs to look like. You need to empower employers to just deliver on it as well as being able to provide the infrastructure that's there. If all of that's put in place, rural Ireland has a bright future because so much of what has driven so much of the, the investment or, or just the magnet to the east where people had to commute every day and there was long commutes attached to that was because people felt they had no choice. When you give people choices, they can decide if they really want to live in a city. Like I'm from rural Ireland, but I've always lived in a city for the past 10 years. Like I like cities I and mean, I love South Galway as well, but I have made a choice. Imagine what people could do if they, their choices were real choices and they weren't just pushed and pulled in a different direction. Um, and that's where I think the resilience piece is going to be supported and activated. Like I, I, I just think there's so many opportunities in the next decade to kind of correct the wrongs of maybe the last few decades. Um, but we just have to put the right pieces in place to do that. Thanks, Matt. And as you're speaking, I was just thinking back to what the minister said said at the outset that you know Ireland's national economic well-being is dependent really on you know leaving no one behind and making sure that rural Ireland also uh, not just survives but thrives. Um, Seamus Boland, can I bring you back in here? There's a question on climate um, and climate action. It would be remiss of us to not discuss this uh, uh, on such a platform. Um, and the question is this. Rural communities sometimes feel that they are disadvantaged in terms of measures around climate change. What are, what are the panel's thoughts about how we can ensure transition to a low carbon economy in a way that ensures it's fair to rural communities? Yes, that is another subject for a webinar, Andrew, but let's, let's, let's deal with some issues. And before I go, I do want to talk about care and meals and wheels because that goes back to the social enterprise. But just on climate, our Shore Link have been certainly following and been a very active in this area. We were very active in the peatlands uh, directive and managing that. We have a wetlands forum whose job it is to bring communities into the space where they actually look at the conservation of the environment, not just as something they have to do or that the EU tells them to do, but actually something that could be an asset in the community. And if you look at the community forums, and you can see that on our website, you will notice that there are 20 actual active sites around the country, Abbey Leaks Bog, Clough Jordan and other places, Clarabog. These are sites whereby the people don't see that site anymore as a negative, but as a positive. And it's the same way whether it's heating at the house or whether it's dealing with carbon tax. Look, we've had a position on carbon tax for the last few years, which has been asking the question, why are we forcing people to pay a carbon tax when, in fact, um, they have no other choice but to pay it? And it does affect low-income households. It also 
creates a sour note for rural people who, on the one hand, know there's climate change. They are not climate deniers. In fact, Andrew, we had 350 people in the good old days when you squashed them into a room in the Hudson Bay Hotel of a Friday in July, a very sunny July two years ago, wanting to know more about what they have to do in their homes to make sure their homes are more climate compliant. So, just transition is a word, it's a phrase. Uh, there's a big program in the Midlands, particularly with the whole uh, situation in Bordemona. But just transition has to be the way forward. And just on, just on that, you know, there are jobs being lost as a result of the change. So, we have to make sure that jobs can be replaced. We know climate change is there. But we are saying strongly in our Shore Link, go back down to the communities. I know where you have been in your consultation process, your department, and start asking communities what would what do you think is the best thing? Remember, our rural communities were very good at resolving electricity. They they got down to bases and got that working. They were very good at connecting water supply. They resolved that by local water schemes. So we're looking at local energy cooperatives. We're looking at getting rural communities involved in providing the solution. Um, yes, it's a big problem for communities because, you know, there is suspicion. And I suppose if you look at the carbon tax, it's kind of pay it, it's pinch your nose and pay it, uh, but you don't, you're not really involved and you don't see the benefit. You just know you have to pay more. On the other hand, if you're like Abbey Leaks Bog or if you're in Clara or places like that around the country, you can actually contribute and make the local wetlands area an actual source of employment, uh, brings tourists, brings uh, study groups from various universities around the world. So, you can turn it into a positive. So, I think that's my message on that one. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Seamus. That's a very, very helpful, positive message to, to end that one on. I've only time for a really short question, but there's quite a few comments coming in around uh, social enterprise and cooperatives. And Seamus, you just mentioned uh, energy cooperatives. Tracy, can I can I ask you the final question just really briefly? Um, like Grow Remote obviously is an award-winning uh, social enterprise. The question that's come, come in is, um, do you think that the social enterprise model has potential for growth in rural areas? Co-ops, everything, everything to do with that, like fundamentally because it empowers people and it lets us solve, solve our own problems in the way that we want to do it. Absolutely, it does. I think, and it's it's also it's just a great thing to be able to do as a as as a person who gets the opportunity to do it. I love it. But just before I go, so yes, on social enterprise, I love all the work you're doing on it, and uh, the more we can do, the better. But just before I go, as well, Andrew, just I sometimes I hate kind of talking about things around about about remote work in rural Ireland as though someone should do it sometime. And um, Go Remote is a, has a bias for action. On our website, you'll find training for people who are unemployed, specifically from tourism, retail, hospitality, anything. We can take the transferable skills and get you uh, employed in, in these companies. We've got training for people managers. If you contact us directly, we'll help companies make the transition. And we help uh, build communities locally. Whatever you want, basically, whatever. if you've got a problem, we probably find a solution. So anything to do with remote working on our website, it's all there. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, it's still for people to move from uh, city centres to rural and regional communities, we've got that too. So, uh, just in terms of action, you can take action if you go onto the website. That's brilliant, it. brilliant, okay. Tracy. Okay. Th and th listen, thanks for that call to action. Uh, to action. Uh, much appreciated. Listen, um, I'd love to bring you all back in for further questions, but I'm actually conscious of the time and other, other obligations people have, and especially the minister. So with that, um, I'm going to bring our discussion to a very abrupt close, unfortunately. And I want to just sincerely thank you all um, for your really valuable contributions and for taking the time to be with us today. You've provided in incredible insights, which are I'm sure um, all of our attendees will have um, got much value from. So I'd like to now invite Minister Humphreys to come back in and maybe provide us with some concluding remarks before we wrap up. Thanks to everybody again for your contributions. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who has uh, participated in the event. 
And I particularly want to thank the four panellists, uh, Seamus, Pat, Tracy and Emma for their contributions. And I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate Seamus uh, on uh, becoming uh, the president uh, of uh, the Civil Society Committee, which of course is part of the European and Economic and Social Council. And just to say that, you know, Seamus brings an absolute wealth of experience uh, to this role. Uh, while each of the speakers, uh, you know, have their own perspectives on the conversation, it's clear that we all want very clear uh, common purpose in that we all want to uh, support our rural communities, we want to support our rural businesses, and we want to support our rural economies. And my department looks forward to, to work, continuing uh, to work with each of you and your organisations as we implement uh, our new policy. I want to thank Andrew for his chairing of the discussions. Uh, and to those of you who submitted questions uh, to the panellists. I have to say we have had a very positive uh, uh, engagement today and there's plenty of food for thought, which of course we will reflect on as we finalise the new policy. Uh, and many of today's insights and the suggestions are in line with uh, you know, the general direction of the, the new policy document. And I suppose if I was to summarise the conversation today, I would say that our efforts need to, to focus on people, places and possibilities. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we have an opportunity uh, through this policy uh, you know, to look to the future and the new opportunities it presents. And Seamus talked about opportunities for rural Ireland uh, and uh, in terms of uh, you know, employment opportunities in the region. And we are being forced to change our uh, behaviours because of COVID. COVID. So this really is an opportunity to grasp the positives uh, in all of this and to build on that. Um, I, I, I'm looking here at how we can uh, strengthen our communities in an inclusive way uh, to ensure that no one is left behind, young or old. Opportunities for our enterprises, whether it's uh, in sectors, new sectors, such as the biotechnology and indeed the circular economy. We can also do more for rural based enterprises by building on the clusters around uh, the, the country in sectors such as agri-tech, financial services, life sciences and indeed the creative industries. There's opportunities too for employees uh, as the world of work changes in terms of how uh, and where we work. There's opportunities with uh, high speed broadband uh, and, and the benefits that that will bring through the National Broadband Plan and that's enormous and it will underpin many uh, of the other opportunities that I've spoken about. And just to say that uh, we, uh, I'll shortly be announcing uh, the rollout of 200 broadband connection points in communities by the end of the year. And then I have another further 100, uh, you know, by the end of the spring. So that's 300 community broadband uh, connection points, which I think will, will be very useful in rural areas. I know that uh, Emma and Pat spoke about infrastructure, you know, whether it's energy, water, roads, broadband. Uh, we are going to carry out a review of the National Development Plan. And of course, I will certainly have a very strong input into that in terms of uh, making sure that these important uh, uh, projects and important infrastructure projects uh, go ahead in, 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 in rural Ireland because we need those. Uh, in terms of town centres, uh, you know that it, it certainly is a cross-departmental uh, issue. I'm, I'm going to work very closely, obviously, with uh, Minister Damien English, uh, who's involved in this town centre first policy. So it's putting people at the heart of the town. And by bringing jobs back to rural towns and into in their true, I think, uh, connected working, uh, people will can work in their local town or village. And also, uh, you know, there can be that blend between rural and urban, where maybe to go to the city for a few days. We have spent uh, about 6.1 million already announced on the special town and village uh, initiative to make our towns more uh, more COVID friendly. Uh, so there's been a lot of work gone in there. Uh, in, uh, and of course, we all know that, um, uh, you know, when you live in rural Ireland, there's nothing you need more than your neighbour. And when your neighbour needs help, well, we're all happy to drop everything and go and help them. 
and the call goes out. And I just want to compliment the local authorities in terms of what they did around the community call. It, it has been absolutely fantastic uh, and they mobilised uh, communities uh, right across the country and they were able to do the coordination and, and, and they were the central point of organisation. So I really want to say a huge thank you to every local authority and all of the coordinators and the workers because the work that you did was so important uh, and uh, I, I, I want to thank you for that. Uh, the local authorities, of course, are, are continue to play a, a hugely important role in the development uh, of rural Ireland. And uh, I, I compliment Pat on the initiatives in Clare. I had the pleasure of visiting Clare uh, on a number of occasions, and I know I'm well aware of the good work that's that's going on there. And of course, I, I'll have to say about my own county in Monaghan. Uh, uh, and, and what they're doing there. There's a dedicated director of services for economic development. That has brought huge benefits in terms of working together uh, across a number of different players. We have the digital hubs, we have a new BioConnect centre, and that again is looking at the jobs of the future and making sure that, they, uh, that we capitalise on those opportunities in rural areas. And then, of course, we have a new data innovation, data innovation centre, and that's looking at art artificial intelligence and how how businesses can use artificial intelligence to their advantage. Again, these, we're looking here at jobs for the future, and that's what we have to do in rural Ireland. We have to position ourselves uh, of, of what's and, and, and take advantage uh, of what's uh, coming down the road. And of course, we know there's no one size uh, fits all approach when we talk about rural Ireland. Uh, it's it's. I've always been of the opinion. It's the bottom up approach. It's consulting with communities. It's finding out what you need. What you uh, what you want to do in your community, and that can be done so well through the facilitation of the local authorities, and then it's about putting in applications to enable uh, uh, people in communities and local authorities to deliver those projects. That's going to make uh, the difference. Uh, can I just say that uh, there, there's many different strengths in different places and the different needs. Some rural areas are close to large urban centres and others are remote. remote. And the offshore islands have their own unique uh, needs because of their peripheral nature. And indeed, I was delighted. Last year, actually, I went to, uh, to uh, uh, Clare Island and uh, this year I took the opportunity when I was in Donegal on staycation, I might add, uh, to visit uh, in uh, or to, to visit to visit. Uh, uh, Aaron Moore, and uh, just to see firsthand, uh, you know how difficult it is uh, to live on an island, but also the hugely unique uh, contribution the uh, islanders make to our culture. So again, I'm delighted that uh, that the the islands now come under my department. Can I just say that our new policy will recognise the diversity and place a focus on supporting a place based approach to development in in a very holistic way. But there's also need to re we also do need to reframe the narrative around the rural urban divide. I don't want to hear that word mentioned. There is no rural urban divide. It should be working together, building on our strengths and, and strong regions and rural communities feeding into the cities and, and, and vice versa. So our, our national recovery requires a holistic approach to recovery in both urban and rural areas. So, with a country of our size uh, and, and the way uh, our you know the way our economy works with a strong dependence on sectors such as agri-food and tourism, uh, the separation of urban and rural in our language is no longer helpful. Uh, the two are interdependent. So, before I finish, I, I want to re-emphasize the, the transformative effect that remote working can have on rural areas. And, uh, I, I, you know, remote connected working was a concept last year. It has now become a reality. And this is our opportunity to position ourselves to grasp this, run with it, and, and, and you know, use it to our advantage right across rural Ireland, because it can improve the quality of life uh, uh, for people in rural areas uh, by bringing new business into, and people bring business, and that's it. If, if you have more people shopping in the town, there's a huge spin-off effect. I believe it will breathe new life into our rural uh, towns and villages, and uh, people uh, won't be forced to commute uh, to large urban centres every day, and and you know they can work locally. It can help us to uh, retain our young people who can study or pursue good careers while continuing to live in their local areas. And uh, every one of us understand the importance of keeping young people uh, in 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 their local areas and how they contribute to the vibrancy and 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 the the, the resilience of. 
welfare community. It's also good for environment because uh, obviously uh, you're not getting into your car, you're not spending hours on the road. So it's good. It's good in that perspective as well. And uh, as I said, there's been a lot of discussion about remote working. We just need to seize this uh, opportunity. Um, in terms of, uh, and Tracy mentioned it there, and we do need to attract uh, and make it attractive for for uh, you know investors to come to the rural areas, and I, I think that the work that's been done by the Western Development Commission is really going to be uh, you know very very useful in terms of mapping out uh, you know where our hubs are and what we have to offer, and it's about selling this uh, that is good for everybody, uh, and that's that's obviously the way we have to go forward. And um, the government will bring, I know, a remote uh, working policy, which will provide a framework for a national approach uh, to, to remote working. So uh, I just want to say thank you uh, again for joining us today. I have to say I found this very interesting, very informative. Uh, I'm delighted to be back in this uh, brief uh, of uh, rural uh, uh, and uh, community development. It's something that's very close to my heart, and uh, I look forward to working with you all. And I want to say once again a thank you to Seamus Bowler, Pat Darling, Emma Cairns, and Tracy Kill for their time and their contributions to our discussions. I want to thank the staff in my department. I want to thank uh, um, everybody who has helped make this happen today. And uh, you know we've taken your feedback and we've taken your 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 views and we will feed them in into the rural development policy. And we have had a lot of close engagement already, but that will continue. Uh, and I look forward uh, very shortly to meeting all the the, the local authority um, uh, city and county managers or CEOs or CEs as you're now known. And because uh, I, I will be working very closely. Uh, with you uh, in my, uh, you know, in, in the time ahead, because I do feel that local authorities have a hugely, hugely important role in helping us in this department uh, to, to, uh, you know, to, to make a difference and to roll out and many, many different initiatives in uh, in rural Ireland. So, uh, uh, you know, the policy will be. Um, I'm hoping to get it launched now in the coming months. So we'll continue to work on it. And uh, I hope to meet you all soon in person. Thank you very much, Gurmila Mahadev. Um, thanks very much, uh, Minister. And can I just add my, my own thanks to the panelists and to Andrew for chairing that session. You know, over the last uh, over the last number of months, going back to last year, the department has held quite a number of consultation events to to understand what are the issues, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities facing rural areas. But I have to say, uh, today's uh, discussion and and um, engagement is probably one of the richest discussions that we've had. I said at the outset that we had a very distinguished and informed panel uh, today. And the word that I probably didn't uh, in include, but you saw it firsthand, is their passion, their passion for rural Ireland. And we're, we're very, very fortunate that we have, um, we have and we have had in the past so many ministers who are passionate about moving rural Ireland forward. Um, so thank you, Minister, for joining us this morning. Thank you to all the panelists and to Andrew. I want to thank also the sign language interpreters, Bernadette and Romy, for their work today. And I want to thank Melissa, who's in the background, making sure that all of this technology works, and indeed to other colleagues in the department who have helped put this event together. Um, I just remind you that uh, this event is being recorded and you can look back on the event by going to the gov.ie website. So if you go to gov.ie forward slash DRCD over the coming days, we will be able to, uh, you will be able to link back and look at uh, this session. There was so much really covered in it that it might well, well be worth looking back and refreshing your memory on some of the issues that have been said. I might just point out as well that um, Tra uh, Tracy mentioned the Grow Remote uh, uh, website. And if you go on to growremote.ie, you'll see the various different uh, resources and services that I can provide, including details of jobs that are, are available for remote working. So, so with that, I'll just say thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, stay safe, and we will have further engagements, as the minister said, as we continue to um, move onwards and in implement the new policy, which will be published very shortly. So thanks everybody.